maybe about 10 people who say there's nobody like him. And don't mind him praising him just a little bit because there's none like him in the universe. Thank you, Father, for another day that you have kept us. Thank you for waking us up this morning, keeping us all day long. Thank you that we are here to hear out of your word tonight. And there is nobody like you. You're the one and only true God, worthy of majesty, dominion, power, and might. And we're glad tonight to give you the praise. Open our hearts and minds to the word uh, right quick so we can get what you've got to say to us. And we can process it in our minds and live it out in our lives. Thank you for these who are faithful during the summer to come on a Wednesday night. We'd ask for special blessings upon them right now. Anything that's going on in their life that needs deliverance, bring it right now. Lift up every bow down here. Let the oppressed go free. Release deliverance in this place. And whatever is accomplished, we'll give your name the praise for it. In Jesus' holy name. Somebody say praise God. Amen. All right, on the way down, tell them, you better hurry up and shout. Bishop's almost done. There is a saying that is so axiomatic that it means evident without proof or argument. And that saying is, let your conscience be your guide. Most people think that the saying comes from the 1940 Disney movie Pinocchio, but we found out that it was used 1,300 years ago by somebody uh, of the Islamic faith. The sermon title, if you look at it carefully, has got a question mark because we've been dealing with, can your conscience be your guide? And so the author of this book at night that I, that I read in Conscience in the New Testament, powerful Cambridge study, scholars did it back in 1955 when they was really doing studies. The author alerted me to the fact that the way Paul uses the word conscience and the way we use it today is not the same. Modern English usage regards conscience as a guide to the future, independent of and superior of any other guide and to the counsel and command of any authority, whatever. So conscience has become an idol that's more important even than God, more important than his word. And so you can hear people in the church tell me, you know, I'm just going to let my conscience be your guide be my God. Just turn to somebody and say, please don't do that. <laughs> don't let your conscience be your guide. That's going to be messed up because it depends upon whether your conscience is informed by the Holy Ghost and whether you're going to listen to your constant conscience. Consequently, uh, since the word conscience is a biblical, it's not a biblical word, but an everyday word, Paul introduced it. We've been looking at and studying the various places where that word comes up in the New Testament, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, and trying to learn what he means by that word conscience, which is the Greek word synedesis. We have learned that it is a post at faculty. What did I say? That means you've already acted when your conscience gets in the, in the, in the picture. So, your conscience can't lead you if you, it don't come until after you already did what you want to do. So it is a post at faculty that awakens pain in us when we violate it or violate that which informs us. This is really serious stuff. It's a serious study, and it's a serious issue in America and a serious issue in the church. Church people don't know it, but they should never be talking about, I'm going to let my conscience be my guide. The Holy Ghost ought to be your guide. The Word of God ought to be your guide, but not their cultural conscience. So 1 Corinthians 10, 23, uh, some folks are just coming out of counterculture club. They're full. Y'all sit down. They're too full. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat every, anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking any questions for conscience sake. 
But if anyone asks, says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the conscience sake. I mean, not your conscience, but the other man's conscience. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all in the glory to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of, of God, just as I also please all, all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. May the Lord have a blessing of the reading of his holy word. Word of God. Be seated. Thank you. Glad you came. Don't get comfortable because I'm probably going to be gone in a minute. The teaching must be important because Paul has already talked about this extensively in Romans, the 14th chapter, and we've talked about it. He comes back again in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 13. And we've talked about it. Yet he comes again. So it must be important, and he must know how difficult this is, and it must be an issue that keeps coming up, this conscience and food offered to idols. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. So you don't have to worry about whether it's lawful. If you want to drink, go ahead. <laughs> Just understand that it's got some issues connected to it. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But it ain't because it's unlawful. It ain't because you can't do it. It ain't because God's trying to keep you from doing something. It's because you want to do what's best and what will glorify God. Amen. So nothing we learned, uh, uh, that nothing is clean or unclean in itself. We don't live by the law, but we live by grace. Even though we say that, we right away trying to figure out what I can do and what I can't do, what's right and what's wrong, what I ought to do, what I ought not to do. That's the law. That's not grace. We don't live by the law, we live by grace. Yet some things are not profitable. Let's continue uh, with our example of alcohol. Because that's, I believe, is a problem for us. Uh, our community, we, we're, not, we're not over there on the opioids. We ain't doing the, y'all smoking and drinking and marijuana. That's the problem. So we need to deal with that. So there are no commands in the Bible not to drink. There are no commands in the Bible not to drink. There is advice about the profitability of drinking. But there is no command that says, thou shalt not drink alcohol. Boone's Farm. Morgan David, whatever it is you do. So, the writer of the Proverbs, though, gives us some, some information. Proverbs 23, 31. Do not look on wine when it's red. He said, now you better be careful. When it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, and at the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper, your eyes will see strange things, and your mind will utter perverse things, and you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea, or like one who lies down on the top of a mast of a ship. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. Okay, now he's telling you what the issue, there are some issues here you need to be aware of. Now, you got to remember, this is written when wine was used for water. That's not where we are today. All things are lawful, but not all things build up, not all things edify. You are free to drink, but it's not profitable. It may not be edifying for you to drink. Let no one seek his own good, but seek that of his neighbor. The principle that Paul keeps repeating is loving one's neighbor as oneself and being careful not to do anything that negatively impacts one's neighbor. You know, I, I, I look, and, and because I've been doing this for so long, I wonder, what, why does God talk about love so much? Because ain't nobody doing it. You got to keep talking about it over and over again because we all need to learn to love 
forget that. Forget, strike that statement. We all need the power of the Holy Spirit to love. And even when you got the power of the Holy Spirit, don't mean you're going to heed what he's saying. So it's very, very difficult, and it's very, and we, we, we break it, and we go over it over and over and over again. Love, not legality, must drive our motives. I'm not tell, I can't tell you how many times in this church I've talked to people, and their question is always, what do you, Bishop, what do you think is right to do? Wrong question. The question is, what do I think is loving to do? I just thought I'd stop and see if you understood what I said. Because we want to know what's right. You know, is it right? I don't want to you know, do anything wrong. It's not about doing something wrong. It's about whether you're doing something loving or unloving. But, but we're living in America, so we're not concerned about how it's impacting anybody else. We're only concerned about how it's impacting me. Even our children have the same problem. Our children are saying to us, this is my life. Well, I got to do what you say do, because I'm your daddy. That's why. And you represent me, and I represent you. We are tied together. Amen. But they don't understand that, because we're all individualists. Just do your own thing. It's your thing. There they are. There they are. I knew they was in here. I knew they were in here. And so it becomes difficult. Love, not legality must drive our motive. Now Paul moves to the example again. He instructs the Corinthian saints to eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking any questions for conscience sake. The conscience cannot raise pain in the Corinthian saints if they don't know where the meat came from. So don't go over there asking, where does meat come from? Just eat it. He says, the, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and all that it contains. That applies specifically here. He's talking about food. Meat doesn't become unclean because it's offered to idols. We've already studied that. There are no such things as idol gods. There are only demons behind the idol. But they haven't done anything to the food. It is the information that informs the conscience that makes the food unclean. So you think something's unclean because you have... You have learned that it is unclean. Therefore, it makes it unclean. I'm, I'm studying a book right now on human sexuality in the, um, in the African-American community and, and how messed up it is. I think I need to do some teaching on that. But when you go to different countries, you have to remember, when we came from Africa, we came from a country where there were uh, uh, very hot and not much clothes. Nudity. Nudity, nothing wrong with nudity in Africa. Why are y'all looking at me strange? I'm trying to help you. But there is something wrong with nudity in America because it's a different culture than that. And so it's the culture that tells you what's wrong. Now, I know this, and I don't want to get in trouble, and I don't have that much time tonight because I'm going to let you go early so you can go home and um, do nothing. Um, but what we do is we say it's the Bible. The Bible says, no, you were reading into the Bible what you want it to say. And so you make it say certain things. So when I said tonight, the Bible doesn't say much about drinking or about you can't drink. A lot of y'all say, well, it do, it do. You didn't say it out loud because you're adults. And adults lie. They look at you and say amen and they don't mean it. They just, they look, oh, amen, they don't mean that. And so what happens is, you think, because of what you believe, you heard what I said, but it didn't make much, it didn't register much. Because you, you have been informed by certain things. So, we will not take the time to talk about how this applies to natural foods as opposed to manufactured items. Okay, I'm just going to hit these real quick and go on because you don't have time and you're tired. God made tobacco, but he didn't make cigarettes. Maybe I better slow down. Maybe I better slow down. Because some of y'all look like you're lost. God made grapes, but he didn't make wine. God made hemp, but he didn't make cocaine. 
Okay, that requires another sermon. Okay, because what we're saying is, well, you know, God, God made it. No, God didn't make that. Man made that. Somebody said, well, you know, I believe we, anything that God makes, we should be able to take us when they go out there and get you some tobacco greens and uh, put you some onions in them and cook them up <laughs> and eat them. Now, you want to smoke them. That's something different. I don't know if God made them for that. So if an unbeliever invites you to dinner, eat anything that's set before you. Don't ask any questions for conscience sake. But if somebody comes up to you and say, hey, you know that meat that you eaten, it was offered to idols. Don't eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. Because the person who just informed you is letting you know what? I got an issue. I got a problem. And if you eat that meat, I'm going to be in trouble. Obviously, the one who informed you believes that it's wrong to eat the meat. So you don't want to cause that person to stumble. You are not concerned about your own conscience since your conscience is free. But you got to be concerned about the other person's conscience. We already talked about that. We talked about, I, I don't feel any problem with drinking a little bit or a little alcohol. But I would never do that in a restaurant. Why? Because somebody else is going to see it and do what? And stumble. And fall. Their conscience doesn't it isn't like that but they're gonna try to follow my conscience well bishop did it so it must be all right not dealing with the fact that what i do may not be what you can do and what you do may not be what i can do because god may be convicting you differently than he does me i'm not getting no amens right there why? Because we want to set a standard and say, this is what God said when God is operating in a, on a case-by-case -case basis because of his individual relationship with each one of us and the corp. There's a corporate relationship, but he's got a personal relationship with you. So therefore, when he asks a rhetorical question, why is my freedom being judged because of another man's conscience? The answer is it shouldn't be except for love. So we learned last time that Paul said, I, we just, we're just reading it, don't get mad, that Paul said, if that would hurt somebody, I won't eat no more as long as the world stands. Okay, nobody said, hey, it wasn't a lot of amens there. Okay, because I'm not going to give up my freedom for somebody else, but the concern is love, not what's right or wrong, not can I, but should I. Can you drink? Yes. Should you? There's a no over here. I'm not sure. Uh, that's one no over there. I don't know about the rest of these folks. That's one. One has been counted. So there are things that you can do, but perhaps you should not do because they will wreck somebody's faith. Now, remember, I'm not talking about whether people like it. You know, there are people, I'm not talking about, I just don't like what you're doing. I'm talking about it will cause them to stumble. So the, the, the answer is, except for love, it shouldn't. So if I partake with thankfulness, why am I being slandered for the food for which I have given thanks? And again, uh, when I tried to teach, what would Jesus eat? It was a mess. Why was it a mess? Because people didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to face it. They didn't want to deal with it. And I wasn't harsh. I didn't say what you could or couldn't do. We talked about honoring God. So if I've given thanks, I can eat me some chitlins. Some of y'all don't even want to eat them after you give thanks. I tell. If I gave thanks, I can eat me some bacon. Amen? Y'all not saying a good amen here. I don't know. I didn't, say, I didn't say I should eat it. I said I can. It is not unlawful for me to do so. But if somebody comes up and says, you know, I don't think you ought to eat bacon. Because Bishop, because bacon is not good for you. And remember when you did, what would Jesus eat? They're going to judge me now. You shouldn't do that. Then I would probably eat no more while they could see me.
Paul said, I will eat no more as long as the world stands. And I shared with you at the beginning of this series what? I am not Paul. That is not my name. But I would at least for your conscience not do it in front of you. So I drink so little alcohol, my wife told me to stop telling y'all that I did that because I don't drink enough to be able to call it a drink. <laughs> but I have to be careful even when I'm going to buy the little stuff I'm going to buy because I'm in the grocery store. If I put it in my cart, <laughs> then there are people there who are standing there from the house of the Lord who've already judged the quantity I'm going to drink. They're just looking at the bottom. Bishop, you buy, is that wine? And this is my cart. Why are you over here in my cart and not over in your cart? That, that whatever you got, you got over. What about that, what that butter pecan ice cream you got in there? What about that? I ain't say nothing to you. I ain't bother you. We're not at church. Okay. I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help you. If I can help somebody, then my living will not be in vain. So I shouldn't be slandered for food for which I have given thanks. But I'm slandered by the other person because their conscience is condemned. And they project their condemnation upon me. Because it's wrong for you doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong for me. Uh, I'm laughing because, I, I mean, this is wonderful teaching. I mean, it ain't going to do you no good, but it's wonderful. <laughs> because what's down inside of us, as we talked about in Counter Culture Club, is so powerful that I could stand up here and do this all day. And still, if I walk out here right now and go across the street to the liquor store, you'd be looking like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, no, I don't care what he said. I mean, I know what he said about, about the Bible and all that stuff. But I don't believe that's right. And so, Paul gives some overall principles to follow. First, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, that would solve everything. It would solve it all if you just did it to the glory of God. You're getting ready to talk about somebody. How is this going to glorify God? I'm sorry, when I'm, let me stop for a minute. I'm sorry. It's not the laws that are important to us. It is God's glory that is important to us. So now let's go back, and then I'm, I'm almost dead. I'm almost done. Um, I'm, that's what the Cajun cook would say. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So you're going to eat. I'm waiting for you to fill in the blank. To the glory of God. How is your eating glorifying God? You don't need no laws. You don't need any diet books. How is this, what I'm getting ready to eat right now, how is this glorifying God? You're going to drink? <laughs> Mic on? You're going to drink? To the glory of God. How is my drinking right now glorifying God? That's going to be different in every situation. So you're not going to have a hard and fast rule. It's not going to be legal because you're going to have to determine what it is. This, this, grab your neighbor's hand for a moment. I'm, I'm almost done. Don't let them throw nothing at me. I'm just, just hold them, hold them down, hold them down. You're going to drive to the glory of God. Okay, let him go. Let him go. I don't want to throw nothing at me. You're going to drive to the glory of God. Going to drive to the glory of God. So how is your driving glorifying God? You're going to work to the glory of God. You, you might have to come back from lunch on time. 
You're going to work to the glory of God. You might have to work over a couple of nights. I don't know. Because you're working to the glory of God. You might have to do somebody else's work you don't want to do. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to help folks. I don't mean no harm. Now, what you want me to tell you is to give you a rule. You have to work eight hours a day. I did my eight hours. I'm done. I don't know. Is that to the glory of God? Could be, could be not. Who's to say? You're going to sleep to the glory of God. See, this is, see, see th we have a saying in our house sometimes. This is why people don't like you. <laughs> See, this is why people don't like me. Because I'm meddling in stuff that they don't want to be, they don't want to deal with. I, I sleep I like I want. I sleep. You, you drinking 12 cases of Red Bull. Is that to the glory of God? Now, don't say no, it is that you don't know. Maybe it is for them. I'm almost done. You're going to exercise to the glory of God. I know how to clear a house, don't I? Because what we want is the rule. So how many times a week do I need to exercise? Or how? I don't know. It depends on the glory of God. Are you, we've been learning in Counterculture Club, are you alert at the moment to discern what God is saying to you in the moment? Or have you predetermined how you think you ought to live, which will not meet certain situations? Okay, this is going to be a nasty one here, and then I'm, I'm, almost, I'm glad I'm almost done. You're going to love people to the glory of God. I'm not going to even say nothing about that because I'm just too tired. And you're going to live to God's glory. So if we are doing everything to God's glory, then according to Paul, we will not give offense to the Jews who are guided by the law of Moses. We will not give offense to the Greeks who are guided by wisdom and intellect. And will not give offense to the church of God, which is, should be driven by the gospel. Therefore, he pleases all men in all things by not seeking his own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. We live so God is glorified, his love is displayed, and people may be saved. Father, help us tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the opportunities that we have. But if you don't come and do something to our hearts, then we're going to be hypocrites. Talking about love but unable to do it. Living legally and calling it grace being harsh on other people and calling it love. So we need your help. If we've ever needed you before, we need you right now to pour your spirit down upon us so that we might be able to walk out these particular things in love. And then if we're doing something, Lord, that is hurting somebody, would you bring it to our attention and then give us the grace to understand that there'll be other people who will be hurting and they'll stop what they're doing because they're hurting us. That there is a love that runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. Thank you. Uh, remake our church. Retool us so that we can really begin to walk out this ethic of love and see the mighty transformations that you want to make in our midst. I thank you tonight, and I give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.